worship him. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can gather and sing on this Father's Day to our, our good Father, our great Father, who has moved heaven and earth to come and make a way to redeem me, to redeem us. And so we gather this morning and simply say thank you for being a good dad to us. Jesus, thank you that you willingly chose to suffer, to deny yourself, to lay your life down, to rescue and save us. We are deeply grateful. And so we pray this morning as we open your word, Lord, we, we trust you and we believe your word is good. It's a lamp into our feet, a light into our path. And it gives us truth that sanctifies us, that's able to save And so I pray this morning, even as we read through your word, that you would open our eyes, open our ears, allow us to hear from you what you have for us, and would you give us the grace to take that next step in obedience towards you. I pray for those here who don't know you, um, they're, they're yet to put their faith in you. I pray this morning that you would save some. I pray for those here who do know you and are struggling and suffering that today would be a day of, of sanctification as, as we simply obey whatever that next step is that you have for us. And so I admit that I'm empty and I'm unable to feed your kids. And so I pray you'd fill me with your spirit to feed your children for your glory that we might look more like your son. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome. <clears throat> really glad you're here. Let me start by apologizing. I feel out of place because both of my favorite hoodies are gone. I'm pretty sure somebody stole them. <laughs> because when you have hoodies for years and all of a sudden they're gone, something's going on. There's, there's some funny business. So I had to get an emergency hoodie off of Amazon. They're only $19. Happy Father's Day. So glad that you're here. To guests, visitors, newcomers, first-timers, this is Hillside. We, we believe Jesus changes everything. Uh, that simple truth really can change everything about your life. And I'm going to do everything I can this morning to proclaim to you that Christ Jesus was crucified for your sin so he can remove all your sin. Christ Jesus was buried and Christ Jesus rose again. He defeated death. And when you understand the gospel and place your faith in Jesus, he really will change everything and he'll start inside of you and change you from the inside out. True spirituality is having Christ in you. And he begins to change you from the inside out. This isn't just philosophical or theoretical. My name is Dave. I'm a new creature in Christ. I have new life in Christ. And by the grace of God, I'm, I'm working on 21 years sobriety uh, because that's what Jesus does. He writes new stories. So if you're here, you're struggling, you're suffering, life is broken, it's painful, I'm going to encourage you to go to Jesus, to place your faith in Jesus. And I am fully confident that he'll He'll change your life just like he did mine. Now for long timers, you've been here a long time, and by that I mean if you've been here over six months, uh, we've been walking through Ephesians and seeing how Jesus changes everything. He does it through this miracle called the church. You see, you see he, just, he doesn't just save us so we can be individual Christians and compare and compete with one another. He saves us to place us in the body of Christ. And through the body of Christ, this miracle happens where the manifold wisdom of God is made known to the world and to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That's what Paul's going to talk about today, that you are the greatest miracle on the face of the earth, the church, the body of Christ. And Paul will prove that to you. He'll, he'll walk us through it. So let me read it to you. It's in Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to read verse 1 down through verse 13. Go ahead and pull up verse one if you can. But you need to know that this whole passage revolves around, you see that dash up here at the end of verse one? You see it in your Bibles? For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. You see that dash at the end? Super important dash. This whole text revolves around that dash. That's why I've called this sermon squirrel sermon or rabbit trail sermon or lost my place, not sure what I'm doing. This whole 13 verses reads like a ramble. It doesn't read like the rest of Ephesians. This is a divine rabbit trail, a divine squirrel moment. You ever had one of those? 
Okay, Paul had it too. Those can be sanctified and used for God's glory. Watch what Paul does here. I'm gonna show you. Paul shifts his train of thought. Let me read it to you. God says, Paul writes this. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, dash. If indeed you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf for they are for your glory. This is God's word to us this morning. Let's walk through this and enjoy it together, this divine rabbit trail. I'm so glad this is here. And and as I looked back at my Bible, the last couple of times I preached through Ephesians years and years ago, I actually didn't preach through 3, 1 through 13 because I was like, why is this even here? So this is actually the first time and I've spent years saying, okay, why is this here? What, what are we supposed to gain from it? So let me give you a big theological perspective so that we can understand this. If you read straight through the Bible, Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, one of the most encouraging character attributes of God that would jump out to you, who God is, is this. God is a God of all joy and pleasure. In fact, no amen, is that okay? Uh, if you got to Psalm 16, 11, it would say, in his presence is fullness of joy and in his right hand is pleasure forevermore. You as a human being created in the image of God are a sensory being. If you go home and look in the mirror, you'll see your eyes and your ears and your nose and your mouth and and you can feel. Everything about you is put together to be a receptor of joy and pleasure. And it's what you actually long for. It's what we want. Now there's a problem because if you read from Genesis 3 when sin enters into the world through Revelation 22, Sin deceives us and it promises joy and pleasure. Sin always promises you pleasure, does it not? Can I get a what, what, or amen, what? It always, it promises you a shortcut to pleasure, but it always produces long-term pain. It always does. It, It fakes the character attribute of God. Do whatever you want, I'll give you pleasure and joy. But the long-term effects of sin is always death. It steals joy. It steals pleasure. And that's the problem. That's what's going on in America right now. We've pursued happiness and pursued pleasure. The pursuit of pleasure will always end up being a prison of pain. It's called addiction. And as Americans, we're addicted to a myriad of things because we've been pursuing pleasure without the creator of pleasure. His name is Jesus Christ. Now, in the gospel, Jesus comes to show us That yes, in the short term, because this whole world has fallen, there will be pain, but pain is actually the pathway to true pleasure. And he shows us this by enduring the cross, despising the shame, suffering like us, with us, and for us. Do you know God, he understands suffering. He doesn't have to, he's almighty. He shouldn't ever have had to suffer, but he sent his son, and at the very core of God, he understands pain and suffering. And in the gospel, he shows us that pain is redeemed in Christ. Pain becomes the pathway of true eternal 
pleasure. Is anyone here this morning suffering? Is there pain, sadness, heartache? In the gospel, he'll take that and use that pain for divine glory and pleasure. That's what this passage is about. And so Paul wants us to have new lenses because distorted lenses lead to distorted lives. And many of us, when we're facing facing suffering and pain, we become hard-hearted, bitter, angry. And Paul wants to say, I want to change your lenses on pain and suffering so that you might see that pain and suffering in the hands of our Redeemer become a method of maturity, sanctification. So he's going to do it in three movements. He's going to talk about the misery that exists in this world. We're all going to suffer. Then he's going to talk about the mystery. And then he's going to talk about the miracle of the church. So misery, mystery, miracle. Let's go. Go to verse one. He bookends this thought. I'm going to show you the rabbit trail he's, he's on so you can understand it. Here's the rabbit trail. Because we have to ask when we're reading verses 1 to 13, why is this here? Why the rabbit trail? Why the dash? Let me show you why. Paul says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now, he's going to explain why this rabbit trail. I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, he's actually in prison in Rome. He doesn't say I'm the prisoner of Nero. He doesn't say I'm I'm the prisoner uh, of Rome. He says I'm the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Jesus has me here in this pain. But watch. He says, for the sake of whom? You Gentiles. Now you have to understand philosophically, you have to understand some level of suffering. Suffering, suffering's unique when, when you're suffering, it's hard for you, is it not? Suffering is difficult. When someone you love is suffering, it's even more difficult, isn't it? See, I can suffer, and I can gut it up and, and say, okay, I'm suffering, I'm okay with that. But when I see someone I love suffering, it's even more painful. And there's another layer to that. If you see someone else suffering because of what you've done, it's an even deeper suffering. So Paul, writing to the churches, says, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, but for the sake of you Gentiles, he pauses, he stops, and he says, I've got to explain this because if I just write this, they're going to lose heart. That's what happens. You read through the Bible. When suffering comes, we tend to lose heart. This is why John the baptizer had to send emissaries to Jesus and ask him, are you the Messiah or are we waiting for someone else? Why? Because John the baptizer was in prison about to lose his head. Suffering can shake your faith. Paul knows that. So he pauses and writes 13 verses until he gets to verse 13. Can you pull up verse 13? He re-grabs his train of thought in verse 13 and says, therefore I ask you not to become discouraged. Literally in the Greek, don't lose heart because of my tribulations or my sufferings on your behalf because they're for your glory. You see, here's what you need to know. In this world... You pick up any book on pain, suffering, hardship. This world will give you 10,000 ways to avoid suffering. That's it. This world just says, here are shortcuts, here are ways under, over, around suffering. Here are 10,000 ways to avoid suffering. Do you know when you pick up this book, this book is like no other book you'll ever read. This book doesn't give you ways around suffering to avoid suffering. This book encourages us to accept suffering and to allow suffering to attach us to the Almighty in a way we wouldn't be attached without the suffering. You see, God's gonna use all pain and suffering when it's offered up to him to connect us to him in a way that we would never be connected to him any other way. You read through this book, it's amazing. This is why I'm working on my anti-motivational line of calendars (laughs) and coffee mugs. Have I told you about it? I haven't? You, <laughs> I think there's a market for it. I really do because every TED talk, every Jocko talk is motivational. Let's go, let's do it, we can make it better. And then I, re- I pick up this book and it reads like an anti-motivational calendar. You open up to January and it says, in this world you, have, you, you will have trouble. Have a joyful January. That's what January would say. 
you're going to have trouble. Oh. Then you open up to February. Maybe February will be different. No, February says, through many tribulations, you must enter the kingdom of God. Have a fabulous February. <laughs> right? That's my anti-motivational line. Uh, my coffee mug says, you'll be hated by all on account of me. Enjoy your coffee today. It's a great coffee mug. I think there's a market for it. When you read through this book, it, it legitimately deals with the reality of this world in a way no other book in human history has ever dealt with it. What it says is this, because sin entered into the world, life is hard for all of us. That's the reality. We don't amen it, but it's true because America has sold us 10,000 ways to avoid it. And we compete and compare and say, no, life is easier for rich people. Guess what? It's not. Rich people will suffer too. It's just America has said, no, if you're rich, you can avoid all suffering, but it's a lie. It's not true. I know rich people. They suffer. Life is painful and hard. In a lot of ways, it's more difficult you know you'll suffer if you're white. You'll suffer if you're black. You'll suffer if you're brown. It does not matter. We like to say life is easier for them or them or them. Life is hard for everybody. Life is hard for men. Life is hard for women. Life is hard for tall people. Life is hard for short people. Life is hard for skinny people. Amen, skinny people? It's hard because you have to diet all the time. I'm on a diet right now. I eat my salad. I'm like, life is hard. I've got six more pounds to go. This is hard. Life is hard for heavier people. Oh, <laughs> it just is. The reality of this book holds forth this truth in this world because of sin. Life is hard for everyone. You will suffer in this world. The question is, will you suffer for your savior's mission? <clears throat> Puberty. I knew it was going to hit right around 50. <clears throat> will you suffer? I got to get back because this is the, the main point. I was delivering my main point when I hit that, that high note. We're all going to suffer and life is going to be hard for all of us. There's no need to compare. The question is, will you suffer for your mission or your Savior's mission? Will your life be about my will be done? Because you're going to suffer and you'll suffer for your will. Or you can say, thy will be done. And you can suffer for his will and your suffering be can become eternally significant. That's what Paul is saying. Hey, we're all going to suffer. I don't want you to lose heart as you see me suffering because my suffering is to bring the gospel to you. You understand this fact. This is the gospel in physics. To take the gospel from where it is right here to where it is not in your neighborhood, in my neighborhood. I have neighbors who don't know Jesus. I pray for them. I long to connect them. To take the gospel from where it is to where it isn't will take work. That's a term in physics. Work equals force times distance. You know that? That's pain. That's suffering. Anytime the gospel goes forward, it's going to require pain and suffering. It's called work. The question is, will you work for your glory or for his glory? So Paul says, I don't want you to lose heart. So now in verses 2 through 12, he's going to explain why you shouldn't lose heart. He's going to explain pain and suffering to us. Watch. We'll go 2 through 7, but then I'm going to camp on 6 because it's Paul's main thrust. Let me read 2. If you indeed have heard of the administration of God's grace, which was given to me for you. Go back to verse 2. I've got to explain this. All we are, friends, is mailmen. It's all you and I are. Our, our lives are very simple. God has given us this mystery of the gospel that Christ was crucified for us, for our sin. He was buried. He defeated our enemy death and he rose again historically. These are historical facts that actually happened. He's given us this message of truth. And do you know what we do? We endure pain and suffering to take the gospel from where it is to where it isn't. That's all we do. This is why the church and celebrity culture of pastors is so interesting. All I'm doing is delivering a message that God gave and I deliver it to you. You guys don't go get selfies with your postmen and postwomen, do you? No, because all they do is deliver a message. That's all we're doing. Paul says, 
that that gospel message was given to me. Now I'm, I'm carrying that to you. Now watch verse three. That by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before briefly. That's in chapter one, verse nine, when he said, here's the mystery in the gospel. God's bringing all things together under the lordship and kingship of Jesus Christ. Verse four. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. The mystery, again, he says it. He says it six times throughout Ephesians. Verse five. Which in other generations was not made known to mankind as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. Now here comes verse six. Here's his main thrust about the mystery. To be specific, here's what I want you to know. That the Gentiles... And I want you to see this because he uses the word fellow three times, but he actually makes up three Greek words to explain the mystery. He says, to be specific, here's the mystery, that the Gentiles are equal co-fellow heirs and equal co-fellow members of the body and equal co-fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now let me explain this to you because this is gonna make sense out of human history to you. It's gonna make sense out of what's going on in America. I think we can all agree, because of sin, there is inequality in this world. Would you agree? There's inequality between the races, inequality between the sexes, inequality between the classes. There's inequality and therefore there is conflict and division throughout the world. There's an inequality in nations. Some nations have more than other nations. There's inequality in, in every area of life. This is because of sin. Now, how America deals with that inequality is very interesting to me. See, we think that if we pass the right laws, we can make everything equal. We believe if we have the right diversity training, everything can be equal. If we have enough sensitivity training, everything can be equal. All America has is external tools to try and make everything equal and good and right. And so we continue to try and put program after program in place to make sure everybody's equal. We do this on national levels as well, economic levels called communism or socialism or capitalism. We're trying to make everything equal. What we don't understand as people is because of sin, the more we try and implement and do to make things equal, the worse things get. Get. It's called unintended consequences. And I can walk you through the history of the world and show you the very steps we've taken externally to try and bring equality to all people has actually made things worse and worse. More division, more conflict, more wars. It's like, it's like autocorrect. Anybody have autocorrect spell check on your phone? I know. It was intended to help us. They invented it to help us. They invented it to make life easier. This is why when I read articles about there's a 70% chance AI will take over the world, I believe it. And AI is dark. I know that from my spell check, my autocorrect, because my autocorrect makes me sound like Hannibal Lecter sometimes. You guys too? You ever had, you're typing out a note? And it'll autocorrect and I'll be like, wait, I was typing a buddy a note, man, I'm so eager for, I'm eager for June, can't wait to hang out, dog. Autocorrects, I'm eating jambalaya. I can't, no, who eats, I'm eating jambalaya, can't wait to hang your dog. And I'm like, wait, what? (laughs) What? Yeah, that's, that's the, (laughs) that's the world's autocorrect. Like, it's dark. It tries to do the best. It's like, I'm going to guess what you're saying. And I guess autocorrect would never say, I'm eager for June. Instead, it's like, no, it makes the most sense. I'm eating jambalaya, which sounds like Hannibal Lecter. It's like, who does that? That's the world. Everything that the world has to try and bring equality only makes it worse and a little darker. This is why Paul would say things are going to proceed from bad to worse in this world. Now, what Paul just outlined is there's a divine autocorrect 
that is going to make all things new. There's a divine autocorrect that today literally could bring peace and harmony throughout the world. The world can't see it though because they're blinded to it. This divine autocorrect is called the cross of Christ. And the cross does not care what your ethnicity is. It doesn't care what your gender is. It doesn't care what your class is. Do you understand that at the foot of the cross, when you see and understand what Jesus has done for you, that all of humanity is equal? There is nothing in this world that can bring equality like the cross of Christ, that can make us equal fellow co-heirs and equal fellow co-members of the body and equal co-fellow partakers of the promise of Christ. There's nothing in this world. But at the foot of the cross, you can have a billionaire black girl and a bum white dude. And they are absolutely equal because they look at Jesus and realize we're equally sinful and we're equally broken and we're equally condemned before God. Race no longer matters. Class no longer matters. Gender no longer matters. You can look at each other and say, we are both dead in our trespasses and sins. We're both under the condemnation of a holy God and we are both without hope outside of Christ. But then when you look at Christ you're, and place your faith in him, you're equally forgiven. You're equally free from sin. You're equally new creatures in Christ. You're equally loved. You're equally blessed. All things are utterly, absolutely equal in Christ. The world has no hope apart from Jesus Christ. That's, that's the point that Paul is making. And he's saying some things are worth suffering for. And to take the gospel to those who don't have it, Paul says it's worth every ounce of pain and suffering I'll ever endure and it's worth it because only the cross of Christ can redeem, reconcile, ransom, and bring this peace and harmony that we all long for. So that's point two. You see, what, what's happened in America, and I got nine minutes, so I'll spend a minute and a half on this. It's very interesting. I, I happen to love our founding documents. Our, I, I, next to the scriptures, I just love reading through the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. It, it's not divine in its makeup, but it is brilliant. And I think what's happened in America because of secular humanism and uh, moral relativism in, in America, we now say there is no absolutes. We come to the Bill of Rights when in the course of human events it becomes necessary uh, one people to dissolve the political bands that have connected us with another to assume among the powers of the earth. We get down and read, all men are created what? Equal. And therefore we say everything therefore should be equal. And I would die for this, right? All men and women are created equal, equal in dignity, value, and worth before our God. And although all men and women are created equal in dignity, value, and worth, not all men and women are equally created. We are all different. And those differences are intended by God to glorify him. It, some of us are super smart. You came out neurologically a lottery winner. Praise God for you. Some of us are slow and we've had to fight for every C that we ever got. That's okay. Some of us are tall. I always wanted to be six foot because I believe life is easier for six footers. I truly do. I don't know where I came up with that belief system. I believe that's true. Yesterday I measured. My son is now taller than me. It looks like, no, he's 15. We measured it and I was like, son, you are going to reach my life goal. It looks like you're going to be six foot. Life is going to be easier for you. All men are created equal. Not all men and women are equally created. We're different for the glory of God. And this world seeks to erase those differences. It really does and says, no, there is no, di there, there are differences, but in Christ we can be absolutely equal because of what Jesus has done for us. Now let's get to the main point. Seven minutes left. I'm going to go 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, but camp on 10 because again, I want to shift your lenses. I want to put new lenses on you when it comes to this beautiful, miraculous thing called the church. Watch how Paul talks about you, the body of Christ. And he'll say, I 
absolutely love you. Next to being Brooke's uh, husband and my children's father, getting to pastor and be part of what Jesus does here is the greatest joy of my life. And I want to spend time shifting your perspective on how you see what's going on here from what Paul says. Watch this, I'm gonna read eight through 12, camp on 10. To me, the very, this is actually an important part. To me, we're gonna look at the miracle of the church. To me, the very what? Of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. Verse nine, and to enlighten all people as to what the plan of the mystery is, which for the ages has been hidden in God who created all things, verse 10. Notice the purpose clause. Why, why did God do this and why did Paul send, uh, God send Paul out and why has he sent us out? So that the multifaceted wisdom of God might now be made known prepositionally through whom? So there's something about you that magnifies, portrays, projects the multifaceted wisdom of God. So there's something about what he's doing in the church that's gonna show forth how brilliant God is to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Verse 11, this was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 12, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Go back to verse 10. I'm gonna camp out here and look at this multifaceted wisdom of God. What Paul is saying here is that the infinite, eternal, omniscient wisdom of God is gonna be seen clearly to the angels and demons in the world around us through the church. What he's saying is, The church is a profound magnifying glass to God's wisdom and it's proof of the miracle of God. The church is miraculous. A lot of people have told me, Dave, I wish I just, I could, I wish I could see physically a miracle of God. If I could see a miracle, I'd believe. I tell them, come to church on Sunday. You're gonna see the greatest miracle that's ever been carried out. That's why Jesus said, man, you're gonna do greater works than I've done because the spirit of God's gonna live in you. Every time I come to church, I get to see the greatest miracle. Now, there's not a lot of amens to that because a lot of people look at me and say, Dave, the church isn't a miracle, it's a mess. Anybody feel that way? Mm -hmm. It's okay. I'm gonna prove most of us do. I say, we'll we'll play out a conversation. Why would you say the church is a mess? Well, Dave, I would say it historically. Protestant church, the Protestant evangelical church has never gotten along about anything. Dave, you know there's over 2,000 denominations. That's a mess. If I had time, I'd walk through. I'd say, where are my Baptists? Any Baptists here? You're not charismatic? Thank you, thank you. I have to encourage them to raise their hands. I could, I could, where are my Presbyterians? All right, Calvin Rocks, I love it. Where are my Methodists, Episcopalians, recovering Catholics? No, I don't mean that as a joke. See, and this is what, this is, we go through and you say, Dave, the church is not a miracle, it's a mess. Look at all the denominations just since America's founding. It's only taken us 250 years to divide millions of times. That's a mess. And I would say, I fully agree with you. What else? Well, Dave, the church, it tends to be all about money and numbers. Focus is on money and numbers. Anybody experience that? You go to church that are like, give us more money. Count more numbers. Dave, the church is a mess. It's all about money and numbers. I agree. What else? Because you're proving my point for me. What else? Well, the leadership's a mess. I I went to this one church. The guy wore jeans and a hoodie and he was bald and he's just a mess. How did he? I don't even know how he got up in the morning. I live with me. I agree with you. I honestly do. I've never hidden it from you. I'm surprised I'm up here. I think a lot of you should be up here. Church leadership is a mess. Agreed, what else? And we can go through, if we had a year together, we could come up with, what is it, 2024? We could come up with 2,024 ways that the church is a mess. And you know what I would say to you? I would agree with every single one of those. And I would say, 
you've proven my point that the church is a miracle. Why is the, the church is, and Paul's under no delusion, every single epistle he writes is, you guys are a mess. Keep your pants on, quit sleeping around, quit, quit getting drunk. What are you guys, what are you doing? Paul loses his mind sometimes. Paul's not delusional. Yes, it's a mess. This is why Paul started out by saying, he's given this treasure to me the least of all. When you look at all of the mess through all of church history, my question to you is, how is the church still here and functioning? Because it's miraculous. There's no reason. You understand, 2018 was a tough year for me. Toys R Us went bankrupt and closed down. How many of you grew up and Toys R Us was like the epicenter of delight and joy? Toys R Us couldn't even make it past 70 years. And the church has been going on in its epic messiness for over 2,000 years. And if that weren't enough, I would say, here's a greater pointing to the miracle that is the body of Christ, the church. Not only why is the church still here, because it's so messy, how is it historically, factually, actually, intellectually, philosophically, that the church has impacted and improved the entire world? How is it that the church has impacted and improved every facet of every person's life in America? Now, I know if you went to college, junior college, or any semblance of any education in America, you're disagreeing with me right now. (laughs) The church has not improved anything. They've been horrible and awful the whole time. It's called propaganda, psychological warfare. Let me go through a little bit of actual factual history for you. A bunch, of, uh, a bunch of people who longed for religious freedom rebelled over in Europe and King George and all this stuff going on. They came over here for religious freedom to say we want to worship God. While they, when they got here, they founded little churches. But were they mess and did they do messy things? Absolutely. The church has always been a mess and did messy things. But they started out by saying, we want to start schools, institutions of education, so that everyone can learn to read and write and learn about Jesus. Over the years, they began to plant these little schools, seminaries, if you will, called Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Dartmouth, Columbia. I mean, some, some schools that would be like, no way. Yes. You, you see, up to the Civil War, every single college was started by Christians in the church, except Penn. Uh, it was a state agricultural university. You, do you know when I studied it this last year, if you take the top five liberal universities in America right now and look at them, they're godless, they're secular in their humanism, they're anti-God. Do you know every single one of those top five liberal institutions was started? That, the most interesting one to me, and I could take you through dozens of them, Mills College was voted the most liberal school. They'd kick God off the... Do you know why Mills, started, Mills College started back in the 1840s? Because the church said, we believe that women matter and we believe that young girls matter and we want young girls to be able to read and write because they matter. So Mills College was started as a seminary for girls to show them their value and to teach them society ought to value women. And now Mills College has left Jesus Christ and it's a liberal institution and the very freedom those gals have to vote, to learn, was because the church of Jesus Christ said, we want you to learn. You see, every area of life in America has been improved and impacted by the church. You don't believe me? Have you guys ever been to a hospital? Anybody? (laughs) This is America, y'all. We go for a sliver, do we not? We will go to the emergency room. For, I know, I know what's up. Tell a doc nothing. We will, it's, any pain is the end of the world. If you go back to 1755, to Philadelphia, you would see the first hospital ever started. You see, not only was Jesus called a teacher and rabbi, which led us to start schools, but Jesus was the great healer. And so the church started this thing called a hospice. 
a hospital. And over the first hospital ever built in America, it said, take care of him and I'll repay you when I return. It, you see, it was started by Christians who said, we want people to know health and healing so that they can know spiritual health and healing in Jesus Christ. I run out of time. I'm already three minutes over. If you want to look at it, there's a sociologist out of the University of Chicago named Alvin J. Schmidt. He wrote a book, a whole catalog of how Christianity has changed the world. If you don't believe that the church, this greatest miracle that's ever been has changed everything, just look at all of the social services that have been started, not by the government, but by the church. You might have heard of some of them. I wrote them in my Bible. Ever heard of Red Cross, United Way, Habitat for Humanity, Samaritan's Purse, Goodwill, Salvation Army, World Vision, Children Hunger Fund, World Relief, Compassion International. Heard of them? Uh, Operation Christmas Child, Convoy of Hope. Uh, There are literally thousands every single day around the world Billions of people are taken care of because Jesus Christ is that good. And he's changed everything and he flies under the radar so that he doesn't get credit and he doesn't need credit. He just says, I'm going to love people so that the multifaceted wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. You see, you're part of the greatest miracle the world has ever seen. It's called the church. There is no reason for us to be here. We are a mess. We cannot agree on carpet colors. You know that? That's a fact. Just try building a building. We can't agree on anything, where anything goes. Dave, the church is a mess. Agreed, and that is simply proof that it is miraculous. It is as though the scriptures are true, that Jesus himself said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And it's as if the scriptures are true that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. And I would encourage you, do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. He's doing miracles every day and he's doing it through you. Let me conclude with this. Paul says in verse 13, if you go to verse 13, I'll land the plane with this. Therefore, because life is gonna be hard for everyone, there's misery in this life. But there is this mystery that God's putting the toothpaste back in the tube. He's gonna make all of us one in Christ. Therefore, be part of the miracle. Step up, stand up, speak up, be part of making the church a more beautiful, wonderful, Christ-centered, loving place so that this miracle, the manifold wisdom of God might be seen more clearly to the world around us. Hillside, you realize there's people who don't know Jesus that come every single week. They're looking for reasons not to believe Paul says, as we love one another fervently from the heart, as we care for one another, we take those objections away and invite them to be part of the greatest miracle ever. Hillside, you're up against a great onslaught from this world. I want you to know that. Darkness is great. It's all around us. It's going to encourage you. It's not worth suffering for the gospel. Look at the mess of the church. It's not worth suffering. Let me share with you Paul's words to Timothy. He says, 2 Timothy 1.8, don't be ashamed, Timothy, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, nor be ashamed of me, his prisoner. Join me in suffering that something, in something that matters for eternity. Join me in suffering for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will suffer in this world. The question is, will you suffer for something eternally meaningless, your will, or will you suffer for something eternally meaningful, the gospel of Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Let's worship our incredible king and good dad this morning. Father, thank you that you gave us this incredible passage on pain and suffering. And thank you that you encouraged us not to lose heart. And so I pray for your sheep, those here who are suffering, who are in pain. Father, would you give us the grace to lay that pain and suffering down at your feet, to find peace in you, knowing that you will use that pain and suffering 
to make us look more like your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, for us as a body, I pray that you through your spirit would allow us to show forth the manifold brilliance of your wisdom. Would you fill us with your spirit? Father, give us the courage and strength to stand in a dark day and proclaim the delight that is found in Jesus Christ. I pray that you would do this in us and through us for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen.